Hello, I'm Emma Louise Coffey and you're welcome to the Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. On this week's episode of the Dairy Edge Podcast, I was joined by Kevin MacDonald, retired scientist from Dairy NZ with over 50 years experience in systems research. Kevin gives us an insight into the evolution of the New Zealand dairy sector. Started really in the 1930s, 1940s. Uh, most of New Zealand was covered in forest, so there was deforestation. And the animals that were brought into New Zealand to help drag the logs out of the forests were then milked. So they, that continued for a number of years. And then when refrigeration became available and we were able to export products overseas, started bringing in dairy-type cattle rather than the beef-type cattle. And if we consider back in 1984, we see here in Ireland, we were producing about 5.4 billion litres of milk. And in New Zealand, they were pretty much producing the equivalent. Uh, in, in the meantime, we had milk quotas, so it restricted our production. In New Zealand, you know, you're now producing 21 billion litres. You know, what happened in that intervening period? I suppose the big change was in the uh, mid-1990s, the big dairy farms going into Canterbury and the Southland. Now, in the early 1990s, about 10% of the dairy cows in New Zealand were in the South Island. Uh, Now it's uh, about 40%. So there's been a big change, and we've gone from probably, I'm not certain what it was in the early 1990s, probably 3 million, up to about 5 million cows. And and talk through that growth. So prior to that, 90% of cows were in the North Island. What did the farms look like there at the time? Oh, basically there were smaller farms. So if we look at the farm size, currently the average herd size in the North Island is 340, something like that. And the South Island is 635. So there's a big difference. So smaller farms in the North Island because of the uh, terrain and Originally, the farms being small 100-acre farms, and they might be farm next door might be bought, so you might have 200 acres, or what's that, about 80 hectares. Uh, But in the South Island, it was basically the areas that have come into farming or dairying in the last 20 years have been cropping farms or sheep farms, which were quite large. And then, you know, talk through the challenge there. Like, what you, what are the challenges of, of that major expansion in Canterbury? Or are there any? Oh, the challenge was uh, irrigation, because in Canterbury uh, they have quite shallow soils. Well, actually, most of New Zealand has shallow soils, because it's quite a recent soil. In North Island, it's um, from ex- the uh, eruptions. In the South Island, it's from glaciation. So they're quite shallow soils and the rainfall in the Canterbury area is about six to 800 millimetres. Uh, so they needed flat land so they could have big irrigation systems. So the, some of the central pivots are maybe 900 to 1,000 metres across. And in, in terms of where is the water coming from for um, the irrigation and is that becoming a limitating factor? Most of it is coming from the ground, so they're having to drill down 40, 150 metres. And yes, there are going to be some limitations because uh, some of the aquifers are starting to get depleted and there will be problems at some stage. And so that will be up to the local authorities or local regional authorities to put restrictions on that. Talk us through system of production. When we look uh, from Ireland, we've taken a lot from New Zealand in terms of grassland management practices. Mm. Are they still as good at the grassland as they were in the past or are we seeing differences? Uh, We have slipped, actually. But if we go back to the 1950s and 1960s, McMeekin and Bryant advocated high stocking rights and high pasture utilisation. And we've gone away from that to some extent uh, and People have been more interested in per cow production rather than per hectare production. And I think to some extent, some of them have forgotten about the economics of it. So in the 1990s, early 2000s, a lot of farmers started supplementing the cows at, at a cost. And so their returns are probably lower. Research we did in the 1990s indicated that straight pasture is still the most economic system. And we really have to make certain we get back to pasture first. And and pick up on that per hectare versus per cow. Which is your which is your focus? My focus is economics. It's neither of those. So it's the return on dollars per hectare that the farmer is getting, and 
production per cow or per hectare is not a good indicator of the economic return for that farm. Talk us through breed and where, it, you know, the evolution of breed. I know it has changed considerably uh, a number of times in the history of dairy in New Zealand. So the first animals, as I said, were beef animals, so they were short on. Uh, and then in the animals that started coming in or being brought in were basically jerseys. And then uh, they became the predominant breed probably in about the 1950s. Then Frisians started coming in from North America in the 1960s. So currently uh, we've got a crossbred type animal, 60% of the animals I think, or no, might be about 50%, sorry, are crossbred, uh, 35% Frisian and the rest either Jersey or other type. And it looks as though crossbred is going to be the dominant breed. So a few interesting questions I have for you based on that. I guess you started with the Jersey. What was the reasons for moving towards the, the Frisian type cow in New Zealand? Uh, well, it was considered that the Frisian was probably a more hardier animal and uh, able to withstand higher stocking rates. But recent research, or sorry, re-analyzing re-anal- uh, work that was done in the 1990s indicates that at a higher stocking rate, the Jer- Jersey is the better animal. The Frisian uh, is better at a lower stocking rate. So people who are aiming for production per cow were going for Frisians. It's a little bit, or it's very interesting that you say that 60% of the national herd is a crossbred. Um, you know, in Ireland, we have done a significant amount of research. And I suppose in the last 10 years, there has been huge benefits to crossbreeding. Uh, you know, more debatable now in the fact mm. that genomics are so strong in the country. But less than 5% of the national herd, is, you know, are crossbred. You know, what is the difference between, I suppose, New Zealand farmers and Irish farmers in in choice there. Um, I I was possibly wrong about the sixty percent. I think it's closer to fifty oh, percent. But that, yeah. that doesn't matter. I think the farmers in New Zealand are quite different to farmers in Ireland. Uh, they're less traditional, and they are willing to change. And that even goes back to the farms. So here you won't get people selling their family farm because they've had the history of it for hundreds of years. We're in New Zealand. That's the way to advance. People go share milking, uh, they increase the herd size, moving to another farm, then they buy a farm, and then they will use that, uh, sell it on and to buy another farm, a bigger farm. So we are probably don't ha- we don't have the same tradition. Uh, there are advantages in crossbreeding and hybrid vigour initially. Uh, that does slow down as you continue on with it, but farmers find them uh, a perfect animal for just a pastoral system. So they're in between the Jersey and the Frisian. They have the ability to graze like the Jersey, but they have a bit more of the uh, ability to produce more, more milk. And I suppose from our perspective in Ireland, it's, it's quite interesting. When we looked at the national herd, so herds that had Holstein Frisians, crossbreds and some purebred jerseys in them, we actually saw that beyond the first cross, they actually didn't lose much of the benefit in terms of, say, milk solids production and calving interval. They were two of the traits we looked at in particular. And and going forward, you know, you mentioned crossbreed, crossbreeding will continue. Um, we have have the situation in Ireland where at the moment we've, we have, a, a, I suppose, a, a high proportion of our land is in beef production. And, you know, people would identify that crossbreds don't work in a beef scenario. You know, what is your, I suppose, answer to that? And, you know, are you seeing issues with crossbred beef? It doesn't seem to be a big issue with crossbred beef in New Zealand. There's a lot of crossbred calves reared for beef. Uh, I think it's a perception rather than fact about the inability of a crossbred animal to be used for beef. Okay, and then in terms of the system of production, you know, what sort of input are ye uh, seeing on farms um, across the country? I know that, you know, ye, um, ye describe it in terms of percentage supplementation in the diet. Yes. So there's been a big change in New Zealand from uh, being, say, less than 10% of the feed being brought in. And in the ni- early 2000s, it was probably 60 to 70% of the farms were in that category. Now it's dropped back to about 35 to 40. So there's been an importation of feed onto the farms or taking cows off the farm during the winter. And it's interesting that in early 
2000s, about 2005 to 2008, there was a couple of droughts in the northern part of the North Island and palm kernel was starting to be imported. Now in the early 2000s, about 100,000, 200,000 tonne was imported. Now it's about 4.5 million tonne. So it's been a big change. And the issue I see is that farmers have been addicted to that feed, bringing in the feed. So the, it's easy, it's relatively cheap, but I still believe they have the ability, they are sacrificing pasture. So every time you put supplements in, there is a compromise between the quality of the, the amount of feed you're leaving behind and the amount of feed the cows are getting. And in terms of that, you know, you were saying <coughs> the, I think that correlates well with you were saying that they're slipping a bit in terms of pasture utilisation. So they're probably focusing more on the supplement and it is taking really from the, the grassland. Yes. Yeah, so every time you put supplements in, there's sub, uh, substitution. So you give the cow a kilogram of feed, supplement, uh, supplementary feed, and she'll leave close to a kilogram in the pasture unless uh, they are being underfed at that stage. So, yes, they are not utilising pasture as they used to. And then if we take a look then at, in terms of production system type, there is a lot of farmers engaging in once-a-day milking, say, in terms of, at the start of lactation, at the end of lactation, but also across the full year. What percentage of farmers are full-time once a day? I think it's somewhere around 8%, 8 to 10%. Uh, it's quite a high number. It's much higher than most people realise. And the, the issue is that a lot of farms are very long farms, so they cows have a lot of walking to do. Uh, so they will have them on once a day to avoid the cows walking long distances. So they're narrow, long farms or hilly farms. Uh, and a lot of energy is expended in walking to the dairy. And talk about the effect of, say, you know, are you seeing major drop in production um, with once-a-day herds? Oh, there's always going to be a drop in production, but it depends on how you manage it or manage the herd. Uh, normally you would expect a drop in production of 10 to 15%. But there's big savings there in terms of labour, uh, shed costs and things like that. So the disadvantages aren't as great as people used to say. And one time it was only useless farmers or part-time farmers who did that, uh, but now there's quite a few that are looking at it in terms of economics rather than just the lifestyle. And, and we see from an Irish perspective, you know, even we had um, some really great people on the podcast. We had a, um, a farmer, Gillian O'Sullivan, and, you know, her comparison is she's actually producing the same amount of milk as the national average farmer on a once a day system. Um, just to pick up then on... We would focus, say in Ireland, we would have a once once a day milking maybe for the first four weeks of lactation. You have a bigger focus, say, at, in late lactation. Why is that? Yes. Generally, uh, well, most of that would be, say, on the North Island, where pasture supply is a pro issue in late lactation. Um, we get summer droughts, autumn droughts, and so the pasture supply and pasture quality drops and the easiest way to maintain condition is to reduce the demand, or that's body condition on the cows, to reduce the demand for the cow. So a lot of farmers will put the cows on once a day to try and maintain body condition um, and still maintain a reasonably high production. So your focus at that point is more so condition rather than milk production? Yes, so we are looking at the following year. So anything you, any production you've got up till then is a bonus uh, from, say, after Christmas in New Zealand, which is about six to seven months into lactation, it's all next year that we're interested in. You can't do much about production for the that year, but you can ensure that production the following year is not compromised by the cows calving in low body condition or not having enough feed on the farm. In terms then of um, challenges, you know, you've mentioned labour. Is labour an issue on dairy farms in New Zealand? Yes, it is, uh, particularly on some of the bigger farms, and they are quite a distance from towns. So the younger people aren't that enthused about travelling or being uh, away from their friends. So, yes, labour is a big problem. There are 
um, a number coming into New Zealand from, say, the Philippines, from South America, Chile, Argentina, and they're being utilised on the farms. So you're looking at outsourcing uh, the labour to, you know, and attracting, yes. uh, f- you know, foreign labour. But the, the, but the farmer has to be able to justify uh, bringing those people into New Zealand to work on the farms. They cannot just go and get them. They have to prove that there's a shortage of labour in that area. Do you see any other challenges within the within the dairy industry in New Zealand? Um, no, I don't see the other challenges other than labour and um, maintaining economics, maintaining profitability. Uh, I suppose going forward from now on, I don't know that there'll be a big expansion or increase in production from New Zealand. Uh, the it seems to have slowed down in the number of farms being converted and the farms being sold at the moment. And just on that, like that, that, that was actually my final question in terms of have you reached peak production? Convert, converting farms, are there many still happening? You said it has slowed down yes. significantly. You know, how many farms are converting Look, now in the year? I'm not on the ground and most of that is happening on the south, in the South Island. So I'm not down, I don't live down there, but I understand it has dropped and uh, there's not many being converted. And, what, and I can't give you numbers. Yeah. And what is the limitation there to the conversions? It's just land availability. Yeah. So we're looking at 21 billion litres. We're, we're at the ceiling there. There's not too much uh, increase happening beyond that point. My view is probably no, yes. And I suppose finally, you know, you've mentioned uh, grass, uh, grass utilisation, I, I, I guess, in detail in terms of, um, you know, what's driving profitability. Your ideal milk production system for the Irish New Zealand type climates? Uh, bringing in, say, up to 10% of the diet for the cow uh, as a supplementary feed, and that might be maize silage or palm, a small amount of palm kernel, but I prefer maize silage. Palm kernel's okay, but I always worry about the sustainability of it and where we're getting it from. And the international thoughts of New Zealand and the environmental effect of getting that palm kernel. I know it's a byproduct of another of an industry, but there's still that um, argument that we're affecting the environment. So I'd prefer maize silage or pasture silage. So th- that's homegrown, that's grown in New Zealand? Yes. And where is the palm right. kernel coming from? It's coming America? from Indonesia, Malaysia, yeah, Asia. Okay. And what sort of cost are you looking at for palm kernel? It ranges through the year, um, on availability and a demand, really, probably from one hundred and eighty dollars up to three hundred and twenty dollars, three fifty dollars a ton. Okay, and and finally, then, just in terms of you, you're an expert in stocking rate, and we we've taken an awful lot of our learnings in Ireland and our decision making in Ireland from what you've done. Optimum stocking rate for our grass based systems. Um, it's where you're using about five point five ton of dry matter per cow. So you really need to know how much feed you're growing on the farm. And I think that um, comes back to the system you've got here called Pasture Base Island, where they're trying to encourage farmers to measure the amount of pasture growing on the farm. So if you can measure and know how much feed you're growing, then you can calculate uh, the uh, the stocking rate. So if you've got, if you're growing 16 ton, what's that, 5.5, um, about, about over... No, but under three cows per hectare. I, I think mm. that's a great rule of thumb and it's very similar to what, what we're using here. Kevin, great to catch up and get an insight into what's happening on the ground in New Zealand. Thank you. Thank you. And that's it for this week's episode of the Dairy Edge podcast. And my thanks to Kevin MacDonald for joining me on this week's show. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.